the United States is pleased with the adoption today of Resolution 2023, imposing additional sanctions on Eritrea. It has been victorious in recent wars against not one but two superpowers. Eritrea is arguably the most isolated country in Africa. Bordered by Sudan in the west, Ethiopia in the south and Djibouti in the southeast, the nation has a 1,200-kilometer Red Sea coastline across from Yemen in Saudi Arabia. At its southern tip lie the Bab el-Mandeb Straits, the strategic link between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea, via the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. Defying U.S. hegemonic power, the country of six million half-Christian and half-Muslim is currently the subject of UN sanctions. But Eritrea has fought not just one, but two superpowers, the U.S. and the old Soviet Union. We came to Eritrea to investigate for ourselves why the United States continues to try and overthrow a government overseeing one of the fastest growing economies on Earth. The tank cemetery in the capital Asmara symbolizes how the nation of Eritrea has defied Western neoliberal economic, political and cultural agendas. Here I am at the so-called tank cemetery in central Asmara, the capital of Eritrea, and perhaps nothing can demonstrate so vividly the victory of such a small country like Eritrea against massive superpower military forces, whether it be the USSR or the United States of America via their proxies. Eritrea fought a 30-year war of independence against Soviet-backed Ethiopia from 1961. These pictures are from the more recent war against US-backed Ethiopia between 1998 and 2000, which claimed the lives of an estimated 70,000 out of a population of around 4 million at the time. The first man we talked to in Eritrea to find out about the country was the president. We thought it might be difficult getting access, but we had no problem in securing the interview. Isaiah Safawerki is a veteran of the struggle. We spoke to him soon after international corporate media reported that he had died after an illness. This country was totally destroyed. 30 years of war, more than uh, 200,000 troops trampling on, destroying everything. There was nothing in this country. It's only 21 years now we're talking about an independent nation. How long can you take to build this nation from scrap or below scrap? Everything was destroyed, no roads, no electricity, no water, no health, no education. Nothing was there. So uh, it was a very difficult task for us. We can talk about achievements in the last 20 years, but these achievements are simply repairing what was damaged and creating a favorable ground for uh, building a nation. During our interview with the president, he said we could go anywhere and film anything we wanted to in his country. The International Committee to Protect Journalists recently said that Eritrea was the worst country on earth to be a journalist. But we were told what to put in this documentary was at our own discretion. <laughs> Education is one of the main priorities of Afawerki's ruling People's Front for Democracy and Justice Party. So he came and made an unannounced visit to a school in the capital to find out what goes on in the nation that is being built. Remember, President Obama and U.S. policy okay, is aimed at sanctioning everything you see here. Hello. <laughs> I asked the class why they thought Eritrea gets such bad press. Uh, most countries hate Eritrea. Why? Uh, maybe they're jealous. Maybe they're jealous. We talked to many students at the school, and all of them were ambitious. Most wanted to go to free universities. Some did complain about the slowness of the internet when accessing Facebook and other social networking sites, though. But I did want to ask the headmaster one question about why there were so few symbols of Eritrea's struggle for independence and freedom on the campus. You don't have any statues for remembrance of the old students? Uh, all the students, I have one. In my school, I have. I have. Uh, 
there is there was one student who left to uh, the battleground when we had a conflict with Ethiopia. Uh, uh, how many years back? I don't know. But so we walked to the limits of the school grounds. Just two years back, the students agreed to, to build a statue just like this for remembrance of uh, the ones who passed in the struggle during the struggle time and the, during the uh, uh, what you call fight we had uh, with Ethiopia. And a number of students, and uh, uh, in fact, ex students of this school passed away. And it's a memory of these uh, students that they have built this. And uh, it was their own initiative anyway. For many around the world, Africa is synonymous with the prevalence of AIDS and HIV. It is an important part of education here. Under President Afewerki, HIV rates have halved. Today, the prevalence of HIV, according to the World Health Organization, is 0.8%. For neighboring US-backed Ethiopia, it's 2.4%. And for the richest country in Africa, South Africa, it's more than 18%. By comparison, HIV prevalence in the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C., is three times higher than that of Eritrea. There is uh, HIV spread in Eritrea, but uh, the percentage is very low, as low as 1%. And Western doctors are wondering why, yeah. when uh, all your surrounding countries are at much higher rates. What may surprise some viewers is that such successes in Eritrea have been accomplished without international charities or NGOs. Helping people is not bad at all as an idea, but using this uh, pretext and using the organizations created in that environment for their own ends is what makes it uh, uh, unacceptable to, to, to anyone. But for us, it's not a matter of whether we like or not like uh, NGOs or humanitarian activities. You want to be independent. It's a very complex situation because you get trapped in it. We've gone through this process because uh, it's food aid coming and the population is deprived of even working. They will be waiting for handouts, waiting for handouts for years, cripples uh, uh, communities. And once communities are crippled, they are so dependent, it becomes uh, an addiction. Governments are subsidized because of this uh, food aid and humanitarian or so-called humanitarian aid. They're not engaged in real uh, productive activities. They don't mobilize their own population. It's slavery, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, poverty, it's famine. You're sometimes being used for their PR exercises. People are, are brainwashed and manipulated to believe things that are not true, that are not for real. Finally, when crises like this come up, what do politicians, politicians do? They think they can still continue manipulate opinion, opinions in, in, in the street. Again, without NGOs, we would see a network of brand new hospitals and medical centers throughout the country, from the highlands of the capital right down to the Red Sea coast. We went again, unannounced, to one of Eritrea's many free hospitals to see for ourselves why healthcare statistics in the country are such a source of optimism. According to the World Health Organization, life expectancy in Eritrea is 66. That would make it seven years higher than US-backed aggressor Ethiopia, and around the same as the state of Mississippi in the richest country in the world. As for maternal mortality statistics, this is what a former revolutionary fighter, Lul Gabrib, now president of the National Union of Eritrean Women, told us. The clinics, health centers are working on it. If it was 1,000 women of maternal mortality from 100,000 in 1995, now it has gone to 450, which is one of uh, the best achieved in the African uh, continent, especially in the sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, the child uh, mortality rate has also reduced uh, at a level which is not yet acceptable because we want to have a zero level, but if we compare it with the Millennium Development Goals, we are on the right track. Certainly no comparison to countries that have allowed international so-called humanitarian agencies to run their health care. During the time of the independence, what the Eritrean government, or at that time the APLF, inherited was a devastated infrastructure. So it has to start from scratch to provide service to the Eritrean population. So the first thing that was conducted was to formulate a national health policy. You see, some governments would immediately invite Western agencies in to dictate the way the health system worked. 
as in so many African countries after independence? No, no, because I think we, we have a different experience even during the liberation, the war for the liberation of the country. Infrastructural development has been key to the development of Eritrea in the 21st century. Do we need aid? We can't live with aid. We don't need aid. So we'll have to have an alternative. We need to develop our own capabilities. We need to uh, uh, go through a phase where we have to invest in a sustainable economy. We've made our choice from day one. Key to Eritrea's development is treading a path that avoids status bureaucracy, but still holds true to the values of the revolution. Unannounced again, we dropped in on a large private Eritrean-Italian textile factory named Dolce Vita, after the famous Fellini film about isolation in capitalist Italy. The working conditions would compete with anything found in the developed world, and I should repeat that this was a visit not organized by the government. Well, I have to say, even I'm a bit uh, amazed by this, because of course, childcare as women get into the workforce has been a major news story in Europe. Apparently, this factory uh, has crash facilities for uh, working mothers. And uh, you can see how miserable the children look. Obviously not happy at all with the quality of care. Uh, Eritrean uh, private enterprise. But what about US-sponsored UN sanctions aimed at destroying the Eritrean economy? Surely they must have an impact. So sanctions have no effect on no this? No effect because it's, this is a private company. It's 100% owned by private right. owners. So no problem with sanctions, no problem exporting. And uh, till now, we are uh, doing very good. Not only do sanctions not affect the factory, they foster the Eritrean concept of self-sufficiency. Government infrastructural investment has made it possible for the business to be involved in the full textile cycle, from cotton plantations to finished shirts for export. We spoke to Stefano Bonazzi, who runs the factory in the capital of Asmara, about what it was like doing business in Eritrea, and given Western NGOs' concern for human rights, how the workers are treated. Well, describe what a typical worker at your factory's day is and what... Eight hours. Yeah. Eight hours we work every day, and uh, we have uh, two, uh, two break, uh, have, uh, in, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, 15 uh, minutes. We give uh, some food, like uh, bread, tea, uh, fruit, banana. We try to support, uh, we try to help uh, also with the nursery, you see. Um, because we think the benefit, the people, is very important to support the life. You're a businessman. Why do you think the West is so, has such a problem with Eritrea then? And when you're in Italy, and you say you do business with Eritrea, do people say, why? When we start, uh, I told you Frankie, when we start, he said, where is Eritrea? The first question. And the second, you are crazy mind. One customer told us, why you go to Eritrea? Why you don't go to Egypt? It's very close to Italy. Why don't you go to Tunisia? It's very close. That would have because, been Mubarak's yeah, Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> no, and uh, he said, uh, but Eritrea is not stable, it's the war, is the... And uh, we said, no, we think Eritrea for us, for Italy, uh, for uh, Italian people, is the historical uh, colon. We are very close, we have biggest energy. Uh, we have Asmara is an Italian city. When we start, it's very, very hard. You don't believe uh, to convince the customer to come to see. Uh, you don't believe. Uh, no, no, nobody believe. Nobody want to come. You think uh, no. You go to Eritrea, but it's the bomb. It's the war. It's the. It's not true. It's not true. We decided to leave the capital and look at the rest of Eritrea to further investigate the achievements of the revolution. As we drove out of Asmara, we came across some cemeteries. Italian colonials are buried here. They came uh, here around the end of the 19th century. The Italians were supposed to leave at the end of World War II, but the British who then took over said, you know, stick around a bit more. We don't want any uh, non-white Eritreans running Eritrea. As for British colonialism, we drove a bit further and discovered an Eritrean gardener watering the graves of British soldiers killed in World War II. 
There's been a degree of rapprochement between the present British government and that of Eritrea, but I don't think the present Foreign Secretary or the Mandarins of the British Foreign Office could imagine the care taken by the Eritrean government over the graves of those fallen British soldiers during the battles of the Second World War with Nazi fascist Italian troops. The highlands of Eritrea saw widespread deforestation ever since the beginning of the Italian colonial period that began in the late 19th century. To preserve the environment, unique irrigation systems have been built across the country, but what's more spectacular about the breathtaking journey was the winding road that leads to the Red Sea coast. It cuts through the mountains. It is an exceptional piece of engineering, costing lives, but a testament to Eritrea's ability to construct highways despite US-backed sanctions and attempts to sabotage infrastructural development. I'm still in the highlands, but uh, on the road down to Masawa on the Red Sea from the capital Asmara, and people like to stop off for a cup of coffee, but it's very different to the kinds of coffee produced by massive multinationals like, say, Nestle. Food security is a vital issue in the Horn of Africa, and whereas other nations have relied on international relief agencies, Eritrea is refusing access to the country. Again, the president emphasized that the people know all too well the dangers of accepting overseas development aid from organizations like the UN. Ordinary citizens in this continent really, really know it more than experts because they live it. And the problem is within the uh, uh, culture, within the, the, the stagnation created by these policies, uh, even the uh, UN agencies and the UN itself are trapped in this situation. It's, 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 a, it's a dynamic people will have to seriously consider. How do people get employed at UN agencies? How are they handpicked? How are these uh, institutions and agencies structured? How are they brainwashed to work in, 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 in an environment? Who pays them? And what are their private interests? the conflict of interest between what they get in terms of salaries, fat salaries, in terms of this uh, grave situations in Africa, that conflict cannot be resolved. Ultimately, they will have to serve their own self-interest. And that's where we're stuck now. It's not only communities, governments in Africa, but even these institutions have become victims of their own uh, uh, private selfish interests. As we drove through the country, we saw fruit and vegetable markets by the roadside and plentiful supplies in village after village. The Eritrean government claims that since 2010, the country has, without any international aid agency assistance, achieved total food security. This was at a time when drought and increased food commodity prices were starving US-backed countries in the region. The Western Live Aid Relief Concerts of the 1980s were just one source of controversy when news of money being diverted to funding Ethiopia's war against Eritrea leaked to the international media. Even so, the BBC figure of 95% of Live Aid funding of war seemed on the high side. Eritrea says that food security is down to throwing out international NGOs bent on emergency relief. That and Eritrea's infrastructural policy of creating micro dams throughout the country investing tens of millions of dollars on modern agricultural equipment and introducing modern farming techniques such as the ingenious drip water irrigation system which has given many Eritrean farmers the ability of having three farming seasons in one year. Most Eritrean women are employed in agriculture but they played a critical role in the revolutionary struggle. People say that women are the vulnerable group. I always insist that we are not vulnerable. We are the society's main fabric who maintain the cohesiveness of the society. We have so many examples in Eritrea. We have been in, during the Thirty Years' War, our women were those who kept the, the family tied, those who kept their, fight, their children to go and fight for their dignity, those who are now pushing also to look after the sovereignty of the country, but not only that, also to develop and be educated so that Eritrea could really share the benefits of its resources. We are working on educational field, on uh, health issues, on the economic empowerment. And as I said, if 8% of our society is 
agriculturalist nomadic and sedentary population, we have a long way to really change the way of uh, taking care of our agriculture, making, developing it to be agro-industrial and women be part of that. Because as African women, we till the land, we work on it for uh, hours, do we share equally with our partners, or with the male partner, my husband or my brother, that has not been the status quo. There is this cultural taboos, there is this religious taboos, but we are working to change it, and changes are coming. But change isn't the main reason why international mining companies are interested in Eritrea. Free gold. Well, that's what a lot of powers around the world will be seeking here in Eritrea. Not just gold, other mineral resources too. But uh, Eritrea is not in a hurry to give its mineral resources up for free. On the mind of the president are issues such as getting the best deal, preventing corruption and how the income is spent. Definitely, management of the resources is critical. And number one question that comes to mind is corruption. How do we best use the revenues from our resources and how can we make it sustainable? This is not for one generation, this is for generations to come. The road from the capital culminates in the nation's main port town of Massawa on the Red Sea. It was trade and cultural interchange here that created an Eritrean civilization that spans millennia. Religion played a crucial part. Here on the outskirts of the nation's main port of Massawa is the ancient Sahaba Shrine, believed to be the point where early followers of the Prophet Muhammad landed in AD 615. I'm not usually prone to hyperbole, but this is an amazing sight. In the early 7th century, those fleeing persecution, followers of the Prophet Muhammad, came here to the Sahaba shrines and they spread Islam in the continent of Africa. Eritrea has two major religions, Islam and Christianity. They coexist despite policies from outside powers. The United States and her allies continue to destabilize Eritrea via their proxy Ethiopia, but the president remains confident that they can continue to defy the will of superpowers for generations to come. It's part of the uh, established policy in Washington. Create problems, crisis, confusion, so that you can manage them. That's, that, that's the norm. Uh, it's not for the sake of Ethiopia. It's not for the sake of uh, the people in Ethiopia. It's not even for the sake of the region. We need to be uh, held uh, hostage indefinitely. It's a sustainable crisis that will have to serve their interests. They create it. When it cools down, sometimes they just instigate another problem somewhere else and continue ma micromanaging this problem. This is phenomenal. And, and why they do it? I don't think you need an explanation from anyone. Any layman can tell you what's behind what they're doing. Is it for the interests of the people in Ethiopia or the region? Are we worried about that? At least for us, with a very uh, uh, wealthy uh, culture, we have learned it the hard way. We know what it means. Our region is, is full of uh, educative experiences. As to the future, the president believes that the global uprising against hegemonic power has begun, and there is reason to be hopeful. It's part of the global situation created by their misguided policies that has made the poor poorer and special interest groups controlling everything. Ultimately, that polarization will have to lead to some kind of, 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 of revolt. And people are revolting everywhere. It's not in the Arab world, it's not in, in Africa, it's not in Europe, it's everywhere. We are entering a new world order. The world order of the Cold War is finished. The last 20 years we have seen a world order where uh, adventure and, and, and hegemony has been very phenomenal. Now it's declining, for sure. So uh, on the speed of, of change, we may have our own uh, ideas, but on the fact that this is a change coming and going, and it's going to be better. Not a day goes by without new slander against Eritrea and her people. The nation has even been the subject of articles about Iranian submarine bases that these children are no doubt being trained to operate. Are you working on a nuclear weapon at the moment? I had to ask the president one last question. 
Thank you, Mr. President, for uh, doing the interview. I look forward to reading in the mainstream media about the Eritrean nuclear weapons program. Are you working on a nuclear weapon or general dangerous and violence and submarines? You look like a submarine commander. Yes. <laughs>